Um, I'm going to be bringing on Sage Laurent, who is the uh, co-founder of the Hudson Valley Film Festival and Woo! president of the, no, he's a co-founder of the Woodstock Film Festival and the director of the Hudson Valley Film Commission. So welcome on stage, Laurent. Am I going to introduce everyone else? All right. Um, thanks for coming out. Uh, I'm going to introduce everybody. I'm going to just come on up, Sarah and Aaron and Carlo and John. <laughs> I'm just going to take it from here. Hello. Hi. Okay. So, uh, there's a lot of other filmmakers here that uh, have ties to the Hudson Valley, uh, but the panel would have been way too big, so uh, I decided to just invite four people who uh, have different ties to the region, and uh, basically just wanted to talk about the burgeoning uh, business of filmmaking in, in the Hudson Valley uh, as it relates to these filmmakers and uh, in general. Uh, but also I wanted to concentrate on everybody's film as well, because everyone has a, a wonderful film here. And so I was just going to go down one by one, and you can tell us a little bit about yourselves and what brought you to the area. and if your movie was in fact filmed here or post-produced -produ here and uh, what you find uh, how the Hudson Valley uh, affected your film, if at all. Okay. We'll start with Sarah. Okay, great. Hi everyone, thanks for coming out on such a rainy, rainy day. Um, <clears throat> so uh, my film is called Hashtag Like and it is the story of a, a girl who is mourning the first anniversary of her younger sister's death. She lives in Woodstock in the story. Um, and when she discovers the man who sexploited and bullied her sister to commit suicide, back online looking for new victims. Uh, after the authorities refuse to get involved, she takes justice into her own hands. So it's a very genre, noir, thriller with a sort of feminist bent, I would say. Um, it's about, obviously, internet predation, and uh, the sad backstory is actually a true backstory that I sort of based it on moving forward, and the, the sort of uh, meltdown of her older sibling, her sister, who has nowhere to put her grief, and she becomes a little unhinged, and, and how she deals with that uh, personal pain. Uh, yeah, so that's the film. Very jolly. <laughs> and um, I have a place over in Bearsville, and I shot a lot of it at Bearsville. And if you see it, it's funny, my colorist came upstate when we were finishing it, and he said, it's like driving through your movie, Sarah. Because we shot at the Bearsville garage, we shot at the Woodstock police station. Some of you might know Julie from Bread Alone. She went to high yeah. school. She went to high school with the, uh, uh, Officer Amoroso, who hooked me up with Chief Keefe who runs the Woodstock uh, police station. So we got an amazing, you know, big production value location for no money. Um, and he was incredibly supportive. He just said, you have to let people walk through if they come in <laughs> while you're filming. I was like, okay, we'll, we'll work with that. Um, and I found everyone incredibly, you know, just to answer your final question. Um, very supportive. That was not my final question. <laughs> <laughs> the back end of your first question. Um, I found everyone here incredibly supportive and uh, interested because it's not, you know, as these guys will probably talk about filming in like places like Las Vegas, I mean, sorry, Los Angeles or somewhere, everyone is so sick of film crews, whereas here everyone's just like, no, come on, film, you know, Denise and Joe at the Bearsville Garage, you know, they said, come on, film, and uh, we blocked up their whole driveway for half a day, huh. you know, for a hundred bucks. Um, <laughs> Don't tell Joe, I just gave it to Denise. <laughs> uh, yeah, so anyway, that's, yeah. I can and talk more about you, it. what brought you to the area? I'd been visiting here for many years, and um, I split my time between Brooklyn and here, but, uh, you know, I wanted to be in a more healthy environment and ski and hike and swim and all that stuff, and just the slower pace of a small town, I really, really enjoy. And also the festival. 
is one of the things that inspired me to come here because I'd visited it before I moved here. When it, uh, did you write the script here? Did you write it in Brooklyn, or was there some I, sort of a yeah? No, I, I was yeah. In, well, you know, you're always writing. Like he has, his, he's working here as we, <laughs> as we talk. Um, I conceived of it to be here, and I wrote much of it here as like an outline, um, and then just wrote it wherever I was. But um, I used a location that's an empty bomb shelter. Um, on my property, and then I matched it to a weird, funky cellar that a friend of mine has in Shokan. So it was, um, you know, and then we shot also, I don't know if you guys know the Deer Mountain Inn over in Tannersville, <clears throat> but uh, the owner there, ha oh, yeah, well, we have the old Colgate Mansion that hasn't been renovated. Do you want a spooky mansion? And I was like, yes, please. So yeah, it was, it was uh, yeah, it was wonderful being here and writing about this area. So I could, I could already envision the space, and then I wrote the space on a real space. Mm -hmm. So Aaron, uh, you have, you're the only one up here with a documentary. Oh. Uh, but, but tell us how that came about. Oh, boy. Um, so my film is called Land of Little Rivers. It screened in its world premiere last night in Rosendale. And uh, we had a great audience. Thank you, thank you. Uh, it's here tonight at Bearsville at 6, 5, 6.30, if you can make it. Um, I was hired to make the film by a crazy guy named Bruce Concourse, who called me uh, after seeing my social media work for another film that I was uh, promoting. And I've known Bruce for maybe 40 years, and I hadn't heard from him in so many years. And he called me up and he said, hey, Aaron, I want to make a film about fly fishing. And I said, Bruce, I don't know anything about fly fishing. <laughs> And uh, for the next hour and a half, he had me on the phone telling me about the world of fly fishing, which he is a fanatic about. And so we went on a location scout, and I met all the characters in the movie and all the places, which we filmed mainly in the Western Catskills, uh, the Roscoe, Livingston Manor area, Downsville, Hancock, um, and we actually went up to the Adirondacks for one scene. Um, and we were going to just make a short movie when it started, maybe a 10 or 15 minute movie. But things got more involved. We met more characters. We opened up the story. We thought about the history of fly fishing in the area. And uh, we came out at the end with a 93 minute movie that was shot over a year, 22 days on the river, and about uh, nine months of editing. So that's land of little rivers. And I ended up here, I live in Woodstock, which I just love. I love living here. It's a fantastic town. The community's amazing. There's so many artists here, the film festival's here. Um, but I lived in Los Angeles for 20 years before coming here. and. Some people might say that that was not the greatest career move for me to leave my career as a sound editor in Los Angeles. I worked on hundreds of TV and, and feature films, but um, for me it was a great career move because I was able to come here and have the freedom to make the films that I want to make. And, uh, you know, the opportunities just present themselves, I guess, wherever you are. but. Here, I would never have made a film about fly fishing had I not lived here, so. Uh, John Swab is our next filmmaker, and I think uh, when John and I first met, he was hoping to make Run with the Hunt in, in the area, but ended up making it elsewhere. But he did uh, do all the post-production here, so I'll let him talk about that. Uh, yeah. Um Sorry, I was about to say I'm John, I'm an alcoholic. Um, <laughs> uh, I uh, I am, but um, also uh, I um, yeah, I, I I wrote my film here. I live here. Um, my intent was to shoot here. We tried very very hard. Laurent uh, and I and my producer uh, tried very hard to shoot here, and uh, you know, for things out of our control, we couldn't do it. Um, but came back to do all the post-production here. Um, yeah, my film's about a, um, 
uh, a young boy who commits a murder and um, has to run away, and uh, he's taken in by some uh, street thieves. And then it jumps ahead like 15 years, and um, he's kind of been, you know, lost uh, the innocence that he had, and uh, you know, kind of become a part of this whole criminal enterprise. Um, so. Yeah. And where'd you shoot it? Oh, yeah. Um, I shot it in uh, Oklahoma, where I'm from. Um, you know, the, 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 the program stipulated that this was uh, autobiographical, which it's not. But um, I uh, was, uh, had to leave home earlier than, than normal, and so there's themes that are personal. But uh, it was nice to kind of go back, and uh, it was cathartic in a way to go back to where I'm from and, um, you know, play make-believe and, and be in control of the outcome a little bit. So. What, what, how did you end up here? Because we met at Sunfrost, but I, I don't think I've ever asked you how, what brought you to uh, the area. Um, I was, uh, I lived a lot of places, um, and uh, I was living in Los Angeles um, as, a, uh, as a drug addict, uh, professionally, um, <laughs> and, um, you know, did the whole uh, gambit out there with treatment centers and stuff, and uh, my wife, who was an actress in my first short film and my first feature film, um, kind of helped stabilize me a little bit. Um, and she moved out to LA. We both decided we didn't like it there. We came here, came to New York where she's from. And uh, I needed to be, I need to live with like training wheels on. I need to live in a small town where I know people and can't get into too much trouble. Um, so we kind of drove up and down the Hudson Valley and uh, I'd never been here, she'd never been here. Um, we drove around, saw a house we liked, knocked on the door, asked if a guy would be interested in renting. He happened to be interested in renting, and uh, we moved in, and we've been here ever since. So. Carla, what brought you here? Um, let's see. I mean, I'm gonna, just gonna, I just wanna paraphrase that before by saying that Carla was here in 2009 with another movie called Knife Point, which was, also, which was filmed in the area. Yeah, and, and thank you so much for, I was thinking back on that, uh, it, you know, it meant so much to have this wonderful festival show, Knife Point, and it's such an honor to return with, with my first feature. Um, yeah, Which, I mean, by I, the way, won the uh, Best Feature Award last night. Um, Where's course, the award? Very, very grateful here. You've got to show that. <laughs> can, you, can you show that? I have to carry it with me. I just have a tote bag with me that I brought, so it was very bad planning uh, this um, but um, thank you for it's we're so overjoyed about that um, yeah I uh, grew up in uh, in upstate New York in New York City uh, sort of you know moving back and forth um, my parents were kind of like back to the landers who fixed up an old uh, farmhouse and we uh, and I spent um, lots of nights as a child listening to the yowling of coyotes in the woods and they sounded like uh, you know, goblins made of water, and I wanted mm -hmm. to be one of them. And and I spent a lot of time, um, you know, uh, imagining other worlds in the woods with my sister, uh, Francesca Mirabella, who's also a filmmaker, and uh, my my best friend, Chris Dabkins, who's also a filmmaker. And we found an old Super 8 camera at a yard sale in, uh, I think, Bovina. And that, when we were like, you know, 13, and we started to shoot on Super 8, uh, just casting fr friends and people from the area in our little weird little movies and that really was the impetus for us to form this collective called Elk Creek Cinema which was sort of dedicated to making movies in the, in the upstate area and I just always find myself drawn um, uh, in my imagination, the heart, the heart of it is up here and whenever I sit down to write I wind up writing, um, you know, uh, uh, takes place here in upstate, um, something very powerful um, in the mountains and the woods here and the very wonderful in the community, so I, I'm always drawn here. Yeah, and uh, the film we did, um, uh, Swallow, takes place uh, uh, in upstate. Uh, we filmed across uh, the river from Poughkeepsie and Highland um, in this uh, um, sort of house that's all made of glass and looks over the Hudson River. And the Hudson River became kind of a character in our film. It's like a mood ring, you know, it changes color. Um, and it, had, it was this it, you know, fascinating kind of uh, um, element. Um, at play. Um, but uh, my movie Swallow is about a, a, a woman in an unhappy marriage who develops um, uh, the uh, compulsion to eat dangerous objects. 
um, and she kind of has to uh, elude her husband's controlling family to discover the uh, dark secret behind her obsession. And uh, it was inspired by my grandmother, uh, who was a homemaker in the 1950s, who developed various uh, rituals of control. Um, she was an obsessive hand washer who would go through four cakes of soap a day, 12 bottles of rubbing alcohol a week. Um, you know, trying to find order uh, in a life I think she felt increasingly powerless in. And my grandfather at the past of the doctors put her into a mental institution where she received electroshock therapy, uh, insulin shock therapy, and a non-consensual lobotomy, and she lost her sense of taste and smell. And I always thought she was, there was something punitive, you know, about it, that she was being kind of like punished for not living up to society's expectations, what they felt a wife and a, a mother should be. Um, and, I, and I always wanted to make a film sort of inspired by that. But um, uh, hand washing is not very cinematic. So I remember I, I saw this photo of all the contents of someone's stomach who had, had pica kind of fanned out like an archeological dig. And I was fascinated by those artifacts and I wanted to know what drew the patient to them. You know, it almost felt like a, uh, some kind of uh, religious calling, like a holy communion. So yeah, that's how it started. And it was, it was wonderful shooting uh, upstate here. It was, it was real. So these, uh, th that was a comedy. I guess. Uh, well, <laughs> psychological horror, dark comedy, domestic drama, <laughs> hybrid. Actually, all these uh, subjects are, except for, I, I suppose fly fishing is not too dark, but uh, it seems that the, the subjects are quite dark. Uh, I wonder why that is. Uh, We're living in dark times. We're living in dark times. Yeah. What influenced you to make your film? Um, well, for me, I was, um, you know, the, what is it, the, the F. Scott Fitzgerald quote, the 2 a.m. of the dark night of the soul kind of thing when you're on the internet getting angry about stuff. And I've always been, uh, as a young woman who was out on my own very early, very aware of predation on young women, some young men too, but um, young people, let's say. And uh, I heard, I read some stories about, uh, really tragic stories about, um, some young women who had killed themselves because they had been sexploited uh, on the internet and then, you know, bullied by their peers and often orchestrated by the predator that had uh, uh, ensnared them into revealing photographs um, and then used their peers' <coughs> judgment and, you know, uh, uh, bullying to uh, blackmail them, to send them more nudes or send them or make them do, perform for them somehow, and uh, it just infuriated me. And I wanted to figure out a way to tell that story, but at the same time, I didn't want to delve in and show the abuse, because I was like, we already know that's happening. <clears throat> I certainly don't want to sit through a film watching someone be abused. So I thought, as a feminist, uh, what would I love to do? I'd love to put the power in another girl's hands to address it. So I started imagining, you know, if you had a sibling and this happened to your sister or brother or, you know, a younger person in your life, what would you do? And uh, so I started imagining the people left behind and how they deal with the grief of that happening. And um, yeah, and then the story started gelling. And then, uh, but it hadn't, you know, as we all do, you play with ideas and you go back and forth and should it be this, should it be that, and how do you, uh, how do you tell the story? And whose perspective is it told from? And, and why are you telling it? So you have to kind of get those things all going. And then also the, the magical, unseen things of inspiration and uh, what drives it. Anyway, so I, long story short, I met um, Mark Menchaka, who uh, is in Ozark, and he played in The Sinner, and he's in the new Stephen King series, The Outsider. I met him at a party. I'd seen him in a movie called She's Lost Control. And, uh, sorry, I've been at a party till 3 a.m., so my voice is very croaky. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but, um, so I met Mark there, and for some reason, he just really gel. You know, when you ask the universe to provide, and it does, he just walked up to me, and I was like, that's the guy in my movie. And he's such a, an amazing actor. And I said, I'm gonna write you a script. And in six months, I went back to him. He said, yeah, sure, lady. <laughs> and I went back to him with the script, and he said, I love it. I'm going to do it. And he worked for almost nothing and committed to it and came on board as a producer. And yeah, but that, that's what inspired me. And hopefully it told a story. I don't know if anyone in the audience has seen the film yet, but um, 
I think it told the story well and it's not and does not endorse vendetta, you know, it's not a, a, a vendetta film or a, a vigilante film. It actually is against that, but it plays with the place that we all can feel very feral and angry about things and how do we solve those problems? Anyway, it's, yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna bring up another problem, uh, well, a different problem entirely, but how did you guys uh, finance your movies? And uh, we've noticed, I've noticed, working at the Film Commission that the the business has changed considerably in the past two years where it's getting harder and harder to make independent movies. Uh, everything's becoming much more corporatized with Netflix and Amazon and HBO and uh, if you don't have distribution through one of those corporations you can't really offer your investors the money that used to be able to. So does anybody want to speak about that? Dirty little secret. <laughs> now it's too incriminating to speak about. <laughs> <laughs> How did you guys finance? Uh, did you finance? Did you have private investors? You talking to me? Well, everybody. Uh, <laughs> Travis Bickle. <laughs> Carla. Um, yeah. So we um, uh, we went into the Sundance Catalyst program, mm -hmm. um, which is sort of like a lab for. Um, 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 connecting investors and, and filmmakers, and I, I'm really grateful to Sundance Institute for their support of the movie, and it was it was a wonderful experience. We pitched the film and met some some people who uh, who came on board, but the ma majority of our financing came from um, uh, these two uh, French companies, Charades and Logical, and they were wonderful to work with, amazing um, uh, minds and. Um, really passionate about film and, and cinema, um, and we're very uh, grateful for them to, for supporting the film. And is that, is that a topic that, that they talk about at Sundance, the fact that the business has changed so drastically? You, you know, we didn't have specific, uh, it wasn't so, Catalyst was, wasn't so much about um, seminars, really, as it was more about us pitching the movie to the investors okay. and then meeting with them. Um, so they may talk about that at a different lab, but I'm, I'm not sure. And, and well, I think you told me yesterday that uh, IFC picked up your email. That's right, IFC. Thank, I'm very excited about that. Um, yeah. Um, thank you. IFC Films, a company that I've, with movies I've been obsessed with for years, has decided to release our film in 2020, and we're, we're incredibly uh, over the moon about that. So, yeah, come out and see it in theaters. I can speak uh, a little bit about... Um, Two, two aspects of raising money. I made a short film a couple years ago that was at the festival last year, and I did a crowd uh, funding campaign for that through Seed and Spark, and I was able to raise $18,000 to do the short film. And um, for Land of Little Rivers, the documentary, I had a private investor, so that was very fortunate. I don't know that may never happen again. I hope it will, but... Um, the budget started out at one number, but he was really good about increasing it as we saw the need. And he's not really expecting a return, I'm suspecting? Well, he did it for the love of the project more than anything. Uh, he would love a uh, return on his investment, and we're gonna try to get that to him if we can get a sale. Um, but it was really about uh, his passion for the, for the subject more than anything. So John, I know you just filmed, you just finished your third feature, uh, but do you have, is there anything in the pipeline for Run With The Hunted in terms of distribution? Uh, yeah, well, this, uh, we're doing, you know, uh, we have a sale, CAs, our sales reps, we've got to go out there and do a sales screening uh, in November at some point. Oh, okay. Um, but on the subject of finance, I mean, I, it's always interesting for me to hear how people get their movies financed, because I... I have no idea how to do it other than the way I've done it. And, uh, you know, uh, did like I did two movies this last year, um, and uh, it's becoming increasingly harder to finance films, um, and it's kind of forced the filmmaker uh, into a place where, I mean, you've got to cross a lot of moral and ethical lines um, <laughs> to get the money. And, uh, you know, luckily with my, my history and background, I'm... I'm, I'm, a, I'm Pretty good at rationalizing uh, <laughs> criminal acts, you know. But um, but it's it's you know, it's really tough 
you know, I produce, I'm, I'm producing partners here also, and I couldn't have done it without, without him. Um, but it's, uh, it's, it's really, really tough. Um, equity's like shrinking, you know, mm -hmm. and it's all debt, and, uh, you know, and you gotta collateralize with tax credits and backstops and all these interesting, you know, things, but it's, uh, if you wanna tell a story and take a risk, like tell a risky story, um, it's becoming increasingly more difficult, you know. Um, these, these bigger uh, companies, it's all algorithm driven. And, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of a fucking mess out there. So. Mm -hmm. yeah. Sarah, you did a lot of uh, internet work on, I mean, raising money mm -hmm. on the web, right? Yeah. yeah how, you wanted to speak a little bit about how you raised money? Sure. Well, my, you know, everyone's route is different, as John says. And, um, you know, you don't want to misrepresent to anyone that you are going to make them any money these days. I mean, if it was 20 years ago, you could actually make a low budget film and return people's money with a profit. Um, today, you know, it's not <clears throat> a reality. And I think that, you know, more and more directors, you know, there are a few people who are getting funded, but there are more and more directors who are making a living directing television shows and then going back and work, working on films for nothing, or for almost nothing. Um, you know, uh, and you know, as John said, there are all these little ways to, to pad your budget with tax credits, and you know, Ulster County has some great tax, credit, tax credits, as does New York, and they've managed to keep them, thank goodness. Um, but you know, if you're working under a certain budget, they don't apply. My budget was too low for tax credits. So, um, you know, it's just figuring it out. I did uh, a Kickstarter campaign. Uh, I put my own money into it because, you know, I just, I can't sit and wait for permission. I had to push forward and figure out how to do it. Um, and I had made a living doing uh, some television work, doing documentary-based television work. So I had a little bit of cash I could put in and, you know, and then I had, uh, Oh, I'll just tell you. Um, <laughs> um, I uh, am a big fan of paintings, and I saw this African-American painter's work that I saw online at an auction, and I loved it, and I bought it for like $700, which was a lot of money to me. And um, I turned around and sold it for $67,000. And that, that paid for, you know, two-thirds of my movie. Wow. But that was just... Uh, Again, thank you. I just asked, crazy story, and I just asked the universe one day, I said, I'd love to own a Henry Walter Williams. And the next day I said, I'd love to be able to fund my movie myself because I can't take one more meeting with one more blank, blank, who is not going to give me any money and waste my time. So, mm -hmm. yeah, so anyway, that was very fortunate. That is very fortunate. Weird yeah. story. So a little bit about the tax credits, I'm just being that I work at the Film Commission. Uh, New York State has a very conservative tax credit, but it keeps it viable for a five-year period, which is great. And uh, it's basically it's 30% um, below the line costs. And below the line costs are usually the, are the blue collar costs. Uh, they don't include any creative costs, so none of the actors salaries or the writer's salaries or the director's salaries, none of the creative costs, even, even the composer, those costs are not uh, eligible for, for tax credits. Oklahoma, is, is, does Oklahoma uh, across the board or is it just below the line as well? Well, there's creative ways to do everything. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's, it's just below the line, but okay. they, they're a little more novice in how they categorize things. So, uh, you know, I mean, you could probably do your whole movie there it would, they just wouldn't know what... No, and no one would be a creator. They don't know what post-production is there. <laughs> uh, but uh, but the, the problem with New York is you don't get the money back until after two years. Dead. Yeah. Right. Yeah, Yeah. it's a very slow uh, payback. Yeah. And then there's an additional 10% that everybody... Uh, a, a lot of people say, oh, you can get 40% back. It's not 40... You're not going to get 40% back on your film. It's 40% on below the line if your budget is at least 500000 There's a lot of conditions. Uh, it's also you have to hire some local vendors in order for... It to for those things to be eligible. Uh, the, uh, in order to increase uh, work outside of the New York City film zone, which is a zone that, uh, that, they, that the unions and, and the lobby in New York City has created, uh, 
which is basically 25 miles from Columbus Circle. In order to increase work outside of that zone, they give you an additional 10% on below the line costs uh, if you film uh, more than 30 miles from the city. Uh, so it's possible if you film in Ulster County now or in Dutchess County or Orange County or any of the seven counties that we work in that you can get up to 40% again on below the line eligible costs and the word eligible is really important mm -hmm. uh, and it's very competitive uh, the reason those tax credits are necessary is so we can compete against the Canadian dollar which is basically a 40% tax credit right there and uh, so we can compete against Oklahoma and Georgia and, and uh, Louisiana and all the states that want the billions of dollars in uh, in film funding. Uh, the, big, the biggest issue, even on the film commission level, is that the fact that you have uh, a lot of the smaller films are being pushed out by, again, the, the, the major corporations. So we're happy that you know, we've had four HBO projects here this year, which is fantastic, because uh, they spend up to $60 million. But on the other hand, we, we miss working with the $1.5 million films and the, and the, the real independent creatives. Uh, so the industry is changing in that respect. And uh, I'm not sure where it's gonna, where it's gonna go. Uh, one of the things that people don't like to talk about, which I will come out and talk about, is that it's an, there's an antitrust issue that's being completely ignored. Uh, you were, there, are, there are laws that say that you can't own a production company and own the theaters. There are no rules that say that you can't own the production company and the streaming service, mm. which seems very odd. So you now have companies like Netflix, Amazon, HBO, Disney, Hulu, et cetera, and they basically own the production and the streaming. So it makes it very hard unless you have a contract with one of those companies to get your movie produced or at least to be able to guarantee distribution. It used to be, again, that you, you had more viable options of theatrical distribution, which don't really exist anymore. Sometimes they exist overseas, and uh, I suspect that's why Carlo was able to find some French money. Uh, I'm going to open this up to the audience. Does anybody have any questions? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to answer that first, uh, just from my point of view. When we work with, uh, with productions that come to the area, we beg people to hire a local crew, <laughs> and we beg them to hire a local cast. They don't always do so. Uh, very often the, uh, the department heads are in the city, so they'll hire their friends from Brooklyn or, or their compatriots, I'm, I'm going to say. Uh, and I'll let you guys speak about that. Well, I, I did hire a local crew. We had a crew of about two people, so it was really <laughs> easy to crew up. No, we did have a very, very small crew. And the DP has a house here in Shokan, and he splits his time between the city and here. He isn't a local local, but um, you know he spends a lot of time and money here, so kind of local. It's helping the industry here. But uh, yeah, uh, one of our associate producers was a local hire through Craigslist, and. The twins, the Tom Ash twins from Sogatees were local. So, you know, we did reach out. It was hard to find people, I have to say. We wanted to hire more local people than we could find. I um, was able to hire everybody locally. Um, for some reason, many of them came from the town of Beacon. My DP, Robert Featherstone, who's in the audience there, I think. Uh, he's from Beacon. My composers from Beacon, my sound recordist is from Beacon, which says something about Beacon. There's quite an influx of entertainment people moving up there. Well, Beacon has that train line to New yeah. York City, so a lot of people who work in New York City live in Beacon. Cause yeah. <laughs> John, actually, I'm going to jump ahead to post-production. John was able to find some great a great editor. I, I, well, I'm going I'm to yeah. use some adjectives that are kind of... Uh, when I was an editor, and here, a you you were very, uh, you know, I've worked with uh, a few film commissioners elsewhere, and they couldn't uh, find their way out of a fucking paper bag. But um, <laughs> but you were very uh, 
you know, we took a, you really helped me try to make the movie here by introducing me to everybody you could locally. I met with a lot of them, um, and I would have, you know. And then for post, you introduced me to some of, you know, Cole Anderson, who's mm -hmm. the, one of the best uh, sound mixers there is, and, um, you know, uh, John, and, you know, you, I, I hire when I can, you know, and, and you're one of the better, more, uh, you know, I mean, you, you do your job. So, you know. Well, there are, there are exceptionally talented. <laughs> the, this area has always been a home to creatives, and you can find the, the incredible talent in this area. And, you know, the, he worked with Carl Anderson, who does all of Darren Aronofsky's films, Black Swan. He, he did my film. He did. <laughs> Aaron Weisblatt's film, uh, he, and uh, you know, have people like Wyatt Sprague who did The Big Lebowski, and I mean, there's an incredible amount of talent, whether it's uh, post-production or production. Uh, you just have to seek it out. Um, so, I mean, that just you know, in all uh, clarity, I mean, I uh, this is probably a question that my, my producers would know more about, but my crew, um, yeah, a lot of them, I think, you know, came from the city because they were. Um, um, working for different department heads who were pulling from the teams they work with um, uh, primarily. But we also did hire people from upstate as well. I don't know the exact split. I mean, I love the, um, I, as somebody who's been shooting uh, with family and friends and people from upstate for a while, I, I, I want to keep coming up here and hopefully hiring um, as many people as we can from the area and um, I hope to shoot perhaps my next film up here, and, uh, and, and thank you also so much for being so supportive of Shooting Upstate and such a, a guide and having so much wisdom and passion. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I would love to add to that, because when I was thinking about shooting, it, we had to take off a year because we lost our lead actress like four days before we were supposed to go into production. I lost my whole crew that I'd set up, and I freaked out, and I called uh, Laurent, and he came to my house, and he sat down, and he said, okay, these are the ins and outs about shooting here in the Hudson Valley. And um, I think we found one of our crew people through the Hudson Valley Film Commission Facebook page. But um, yeah, very supportive. I appreciate it. Well, we try. At, at the very least, we try. <laughs> and yeah, I guess this is kind of a related question. It's also for all of you. Do you find, in, in terms of post-production facilities, like if you needed a soundstage, um, or a really sophisticated editing facility, do you think that, you know, the, this area could use more? I mean... I'm going to jump in again, sorry. No. And you guys can go into your, your whole post-production thing, but, you know, post-production, I was a film editor for many years in the city when I lived, I worked on 49th Street and I visited uh, Sound One and all the building, all the Magno and all the places down there every day. That system doesn't exist anymore. You can edit, most of the post-production people I know have a little cabin overlooking a reservoir. And I would never, ever leave a cabin like that if I had the opportunity. So when people talk about opening up uh, big post-production places where it's the old system from the 80s, that just doesn't exist anymore. The, in the internet is too powerful. You know, Wyatt Sprague, who I mentioned before, did most of the sound for Roma last year. The, if you've seen the movie Roma, the opening scene, which is the carport, where the mm -hmm. maid is washing the carport, that sound was recorded in Glenford, which is six miles from here. And it was sent to the Mexican director and the dog that's howling the plane. That was all recorded right here. So you can do things now in the comfort of your own home. Well, in terms of production, that's 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 true, but much less so with post-production. Post-production, you know, uh, Chad Smith, who did uh, all of the color correction for uh, the. He did my film. <laughs> Aaron Weisblatt. <laughs> it's true with you know, it's true with TV and and, and production much more than than post-production. Post-production has just changed completely. Uh, you can. I, I, I thought about that. I thought, you know, should I move up here full time and try and build a soundstage? 
you know, take over Utopia Studios or something, because when that all fell into disarray up here, you thought, well, what could you do with that big building? Um, I, I don't know, I think a lot of people would like to come shoot up here if their schedule's allowed, because it's beautiful, it's a nice place to sequester actors, um, safe space, healthy space, you know, all that stuff. Um, but, you know, I need to sell a lot of paintings to make that happen. <laughs> Uh, Laurent, do you have anything to say about Stockade Works? Any oh, news or? Not really. No. Okay. I, 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 on, I mean, honestly, if you want to open a soundstage around here, it's, it's financial suicide. It makes mm. absolutely no sense. Uh, mm. People come here because of the locations. They don't come here for big warehouses. And the, the tax credits basically require you to use a soundstage for one day. All you have to do is put three flats up in a sound stage. So I tell people who want to open a sound stage that if you're really lucky, you're going to rent your space for five days a year and you might get paid $5,000. You might pay off your heating bill for February mm. if you're lucky. Unless you can guarantee a TV show that's going to be in there for a year. And you can't do that because it's too competitive. If the tax credit goes down the drain, which it has in the past, that TV show will leave the state before you could open your eyes again. Mm. So it just doesn't make any sense financially. As, as you're attracting and kind of welcoming and letting people know about this area as the Hudson Valley Film Commission, do you have a database of sound people, oh, writing, yeah. all that stuff? Yeah, we have a huge uh, directory online, which people help themselves to all the time and put on their website. Uh, but we all, we have, we're always uh, keeping track of local crew and, and recommending them. And as soon as we're contacted by a film, we immediately start begging them to hire locals. And again, it's very hard uh, because again, you know, it's, it's, it's a very difficult business. You're trusting people with millions of dollars or at the very least half a million dollars and you want to trust the people you're working with. So I understand why people hire, the department heads hire their friends and they also want to get their next job from their friends. So it's a, it's a cycle that, that we understand. Uh, the more people in this area work in the industry, the more they become part of that loop, the more they get hired. So it, uh, it works out eventually. On the, like the HBO film, the, the TV series that just filmed with Mark Ruffalo, that was an eight month production. And we knew it was gonna, that eventually all of the people that came up from the city would, would probably get tired and leave, and they did. And they were replaced by local grips and local workers. And mm. And uh, the production realized that uh, people in the area actually don't have gaps between their teeth and spit tobacco <laughs> all day. And even if they did, they could probably do the work. And when they said that Orange is the New Black came into Rockland County and they brought you know X number of millions in there, I just wondered what that meant by they came into. And then what was that venue we were in last night for the gala? Is that a post? Is that a that is a that is a certified soundstage. Yes. But I think that's been rented twice this year, so they're not going to pay their heating bill from film business. Mm -hmm. But uh, Rockland is actually in the zone, so we don't, we don't include Rockland as part of our territory. Uh, if you film in Rockland, you, you, get, you can get zone status, which means it's a very complicated issue. I don't want to bore everybody with it, uh, but it means that you can work as a local within the zone and it's they make the lobby the the new york city film lobby makes it easier to film within the zone um it's when you leave the zone that things get difficult where you have no they used an old they used an old prison uh, actually an, an old uh, i think it was a psych center or something Yep. Hold on. Um, do you all get involved marketing your films once they're done, or your distributors help you with that? Um, 
Yeah, I mean, it's something that 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 right now our distributor IFC is is has a lot of these people working on, and you know, that's their there's people who study, you know, that's their thing, marketing and releasing a film and all of that. But they, you know, we, um, and I've never this is my first time uh, doing a feature uh, fiction film, uh, but for my feature documentary, The Swell Season, um, we did we sort of combined with with our distributor to try to try to do it but it's something I'm still learning about um, but clearly vitally important to getting getting the movie to people is it something you're interested in doing uh, out of curiosity I mean I find that uh, the you know be, being a creative and being a salesman is, or is kind of a completely different mindset and a split personality it, it is you it's interesting being a director because you find yourself wearing a lot of different hats and sort of learning as you know the certain areas that I'm you know, I'm fascinated with and obsessed with like storytelling and you know uh, um, conjuring a film, working with actors, you know, camera direction, all that. But the act of like taking a film and putting it out there in the world and figuring out how to get people excited about it—that's something that I'm I'm curious about. You know, but it's um, it's obviously not where my skill sets lie, and it's something that I think uh, some filmmakers I know have been very smart about and launched certain campaigns where they've managed to take a movie that wouldn't necessarily get attention and through good and interesting and innovative marketing have brought it in front of people. Um, and so I think there's a real talent and skill to it. I'd like to learn more about it. Um, you know, I mean, uh, yeah. Well, you, 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 does Jeremy take care of most of that with you or do you actually get involved at all in, uh, in that well, part? Because I noticed, I mean, you went to a, a, your next film amazingly fast and that's an amazing yeah, well, thing this, to be able to do. Uh, uh, well, a couple things. Um, Roman the Hunted, uh, we're in the process of setting up that rollout, so the actual marketing of it hasn't occurred yet. Um, however, you know, Jeremy and I are both, you know, very much uh, equal partners in every aspect of the film, and obviously he, he has a much more uh, business-oriented mind uh, than I do, and and we kind of know where to defer to each other uh, when responsibilities come up. But um, on my um, my first two films, or my first short film, and then my first feature film, uh, I don't know. I, I've never uh, had any success when I make something and just wait for somebody to come tell me how great it is because um, they never fucking show up. Right. Um, so you know, with my first short film, I. Uh, made a short film, and then I just got in the car and drove around the country and rented out theaters and papered the town and just packed each theater as much as I could, um, whether it was five people or 20 or whatever, and that's how I raised money for the feature, and then when I did the feature, when we sold it, I retained the theatrical rights so I could do the same thing, mm. and um, because I know, you know, with these little movies, um, they don't give a shit, they're just going to shit it out on cable and mm -hmm. some maybe somebody in Nebraska is going to watch it, but nobody really, they're, they're, nobody's going to find your movie. So you kind of got to force it down people's throats. So that's what I did with my, fe my feature, um, my first feature. And then, and then springboarded that and I met Jeremy and he and I got Roman Dante made. And then, you know, it's the same thing where uh, I knew, you know, I happened upon this story for my, my newest film, Body Brokers, that we just shot. And uh, it was a true story and expose and, and very timely. And uh, I didn't want to miss a window to make a movie. Um, I've learned that, you know, I have friends that are filmmakers that make their first movie. We made our first movie at the same time, and they still haven't made another movie because they're sitting around waiting for somebody to tell them, oh, it's time to make another movie. Yeah. And, um, you know, so I made Run with the Hunted, and uh, I saw a window where, you know, the cast reps were going to have to see the film. And uh, so I, I, I wrote this other script. And we went, Jeremy and I went out and showed the cast reps, you know, these talent agents that kind of hold the keys to everything. Um, we showed them the film, they liked it, and we immediately just shoved body brokers down their throats and, uh, you know, just kept going. Um, but I find that, you know, it's such an uh, industry of relevance and, you know, kind of the whole what have you done for me lately kind of thing. And uh, I don't know. I. Uh, I just want to keep making movies, and you know, um, you know that's that's the only part of it I really care about—the pageantry and all that kind of stuff. I don't really care about, but um, uh, 
but I but I've I've learned that there nowadays with the problems we were talking about with the uh, the disparity of kind of the middle tier movie and it's you know either a million or, or less or a hundred million up you know that the like like Carlo was saying how you wear a bunch of uh, different hats like I don't know how I've produced everything I've ever done. Be, and, and luckily, I have a producing partner who's as uh, headstrong as I am, and mm. and is successful with just getting shit done. That um, you know, I have a partner in that. But I don't know how you uh, divorce the two between salesman and artist. And I've had to trick myself into uh, learning and and treating the salesmanship as an art. So you know, I mean, the the funnest part about directing for me is is manipulating. You know, manipulating uh, time and uh, you know these uh, these circumstances that aren't real, and playing with actors and writing. You know, I mean, and I kind of got to apply the same shit when I'm raising money. You know, and I'm in a room with somebody, and I got to paint this picture of everything. You know, when you meet an investor, they either want money or they want to walk a red carpet. It's one of the two, and if y you got a fucking Tell them what they want to hear, you know, uh, and and use whatever their wants are to to get what you want, and so the salesmanship is just a part of it, and I don't expect anybody to ever tell me that that's not my job because, uh, you know, I, I've just learned you can't wait for anybody to do anything, otherwise you're going to be just right where you're at, right where you're at, you know, so. Just to sort of add on to that, yeah, I think that one thing which is crucially important that they didn't really teach us in film school is like find amazing producers. Like there are incredible producers out there and the collaboration between the director and the producer is this very sacred thing that will allow you to get your movie made and will allow um, you to have people, creative minds that become your, hopefully your, your uh, collaborators for many, many years. I was very lucky to work with uh, the great producers Molly Asher and Minette Louie and a lot of they are, you know, can can do all of those roles in terms of like they've put out movies before. So you're a first time director, you're working with producers who've made like five films. They've seen it go them go through the process, and they have, you know, um, a whole uh, systems of of how to think about them. But I agree too that it's a lot about inspiring people. You know, you meet somebody and you have to try to, you know, convince them to sort of um, make a, conjure some work of art under your banner. And a lot of that is about. Um, inspiring them and bringing them into the world of your imagination and saying, well, okay, so why do we want to make this movie? Well, because we're going to do something meaningful or important or we're making a movie that, that is powerful and talking with people and connecting with people and having that kind of moment of, of you know, kinship and, or, and you know, um, love of cinema is, is part of the skill of being a director, finding those bonds, those connections, and then hopefully fostering them and, and, can, and then people hopefully want to work with you again. That's, that is definitely something that... Um, you know, if you spend all your time, like a lot of us probably do, in our layers like writing, you know, you have to sort of put the, that sort of, you know, that's, that is something you have to also get good at, is, is to uh, find people that you really want to work with and hopefully they'll want to work with you. Hi. Um, I'm curious to know uh, how involved uh, you all are with the, the creation of the trailers for your films. Um, and if you're you know, using the same resources as you would use on the actual film itself, or if that's something that you outsource to like a creative agency to come up with what that elevator pitch kind of thing is going to be. Anybody? Anybody have a trailer actually? I, I do, yeah. I cut it myself. Um, I wish I could have afforded to uh, outsource it, but um, you, when you're so close to, to your project, it's hard to really see how to market it. So, um, yeah, I cut mine myself, and it turned out pretty well. Mm -hmm. yeah. if, you, if you go to the uh, website for Woodstock Film Festival and go into the tickets for my film, hashtag like, the trailer's at the bottom, and you can see it. But um, it's funny because that was actually shot on the C300, because I knew it would only probably ever be this big. Um, and I did it as a proof of concept for the film when I was trying to get money. I was in that waiting stage that John talks about. And uh, I ended up um, using that as my trailer and just took out some of the shots of the girl who was the stand-in and then put my actress in there. So, yeah, that's how I did my trailer. But these guys are more experienced with that, and I'm sure 
you know, you have a distributor come on board, then they're going to say, no, we want to make a trailer like this or like that, or, you know, the sales team, the marketing team for who dis distributes it. But, um, yeah, uh, my pet peeve I was put out there is the trailer that tells you the whole damn film. No, I hate that. Oh, I hate that. I want to <laughs> see, I want to discover it as we spend years writing it and making it. Don't tell me the whole story. Yeah. But, yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I've, I've cut my own trailers before, and uh, I really, you know, really quite like them. And then, um, but like she was mentioning, that you know, there's different. There's trailers serve different purposes. You know, uh, I mean, like uh, we've had a sales team cut a trailer for us before, and it, it looked like a fucking Bruce Willis movie, and, um, <laughs> which was cool to see. I was like, I didn't know that I made that kind of movie, um, <laughs> and uh, I didn't. But um, you know, somebody in Cambodia is gonna sure think I did, and uh, they're gonna hopefully buy it. But um, um, but you know, it's it's like uh, it, it's nice to have the luxury. If you have the luxury of hiring somebody that uh, has done work that you like, it's nice to kind of give them the keys and, and see what they come up with. But um, you know, if you're if if you're just kind of paired with somebody who it, it's all taste, you know. Like we, the artwork for our film, the the, the poster, I'm I'm really really proud of, um, and. Uh, you know, it's not. It's because I didn't do it, but uh, but my producer and I sought out somebody that we really liked the work that they did. Um, so I think if you have the opportunity to do that, it's it's it can be a, and that's what filmmaking is. Is if I mean, I think everybody would say uh, the best work in my film was not done by me, you know, but it was done by the people that I hired um, because I trust their vision, you know. So especially as a director, uh, you know, my, my job is more about just management. Um, and, and finding people that I trust their vision to do the work, and I just kind of get to witness it and make sure it stays within the lines, you know? So, yeah, I don't know. Um, yeah, I mean, it, I definitely agree with that, that it's a, it's a family of artists and collaborators that come together, and that's one of the thrilling things about making a movie is seeing some, you know, like I, my, my DP, you know, Kate Arzmendi, like, like watching, you know, her vision and her work was, uh, and collaborating with her was amazing. But trailers were working, uh, with IFC now on the trailer, so um, we're waiting to look at it, and I'm excited. But I think trailers have become even more important these days. It's mm -hmm. it's because, especially because of the internet, and I mean, you have those YouTube videos of people watching trailers and filming themselves watching trailers, and it's like filming trailer. themselves. Watching yeah, there's trailers. a lot of like when a big budget movie comes out, the popular YouTube video is you film yourself reacting to the trailer, and then that becomes a new. So it's like this kind of you know. Um, self-reflexive artwork that's being created, but trailers themselves, yeah, are extremely, extremely important, and and uh, I think therefore need to really, hopefully, capture the film in a way that really brings people in. If they're not done well, then yeah, the whole story is completely revealed, and then why would you ever? I don't even. Sometimes I don't even watch those. And if they're done really well, then there's all this hype and energy and excitement about the movie, and people can't wait to see it. And sometimes the trailer is better than the movie when you <laughs> actually see it. It's another problem, but like. It is an art, it's an art, you know, like anything else. And it's something I'm still learning about as a director because you conceive your film as like 95 minutes and then it's like, oh, we have to do like a two minute version of the thing to get people to watch it. But in their best forms, I think it's kind of like a, like a menu, like a palette, it just gets you into this, the uh, environment, the soul of the film, just enough that you're like, I have to see that strange universe. Hi, I have a very uh, practical question. For people who maybe aren't producers or directors or writers who live up in this area, um, what do you think is the best way to get into this side of the business? Like, I, I'll give you an example. I live in Beacon, and I've worked at MTV, Showtime, Sci-Fi, on the marketing, events, and business development side. So from your guys' point of view, I don't even know how easy this is to answer, how would you recommend sort of you know, networking and getting into that side of the business and are there those kinds of opportunities here? Does that make sense? <laughs> <laughs> I would say talk to the Woodstock Film Festival. They do lots of events and marketing. Uh, I, I mean, it really depends on, on your job description. Uh, regretfully, we, we tell most people that if they want to get a job, the easiest way to get a job is to, is to be a production assistant because people are always willing to hire a production assistant. It doesn't mean that you're going to be a production assistant for more than a day, because if you're qualified, you may get moved up to production office coordinator, because you know what you're doing. But uh, that's just one of the, 
That's where they are usually willing to hire when a, when a production comes in, like an HBO production. They will hire production assistants. We probably got 60 production assistants hired on, uh, on the Mark Ruffalo project, and those people were all moved up. A lot of them were moved up to, to different positions. Um, I mean, we, again, we have a directory. We have, a, we, we, we have a, all, all of that information is available, and people get phone calls all the time. So you're welcome to fill out the form that we have on our website, and we will add you to the directory. Sure. There are also uh, meetings throughout the Hudson Valley for creatives that you can find. I know there's one in Kingston that happens every month. Blair, what's the name of that? Yeah. It's my wife, Blair. She knows a lot of stuff. <laughs> we do have mixers every now and then, too, as well. So, but. Uh, yeah, I mean, one example is my PA that became an associate producer on the film because he was so incredibly hands on. Like, he was, you know, yes, ma'am, no, ma'am, got it done, didn't jerk around. And I was like, okay, this is a guy who knows what he's doing. And uh, I ended up giving him a bump up and a credit as associate producer. So now I can, you know, Are you talking about Willis? No. Oh. <laughs> I'm talking about Jeff Haber from okay. Kingston, who's a great guy. Also, since you're from Beacon, I think Sinhub does events every month or so. I yeah, Sinhub has a lot of uh, mixers as well. So it's a good place to meet people. I had a question that's not necessarily related to working in the Hudson Valley, but do you each have like a aha moment when you kind of took yourself seriously and said, oh yeah, I'm a director, or oh yeah, I'm a, <laughs> I'm a, I'm a, this is what I do. I, I've got s over 60 short films question. on YouTube, but uh, I work for a not-for-profit, so I never really considered myself, you know, I was just doing the program in the not-for-profit, teaching kids, veterans, women how to make films. But it was when I started coming around to film festivals that I was like, oh, I'm a producer? Oh my God. <laughs> so when, when did you, you know, have that little like, oh, what? I am moment. Hmm. I have sure. to. Um, I, I'm sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say, I have to remind myself that all the time. <laughs> <laughs> I went to college for, I was studying media studies, um, and then, but all my time was spent in the weekends and, um, and after, you know, classes, um, shooting Super 8 films uh, with my friends, and I remember one moment where um, we had made the horrible choice to record the sound on a tape recorder, and we were trying to, <laughs> To, and of course, it kept going out of sync every two seconds because it doesn't match, you know, the tape recorders and it doesn't have a, a steady frame rate. So we were putting it together and we were also thinking we were going to edit Super 8 and we put the, we put, you know, the film through the projector and it, it caught and it caught fire. And I just remember watching our movie like burn beautifully, like <laughs> just one frame, thank God. But it, it just like that, you know, so, a, a projected, you know, sort of, and I was like, I just of filmmaking, God, you know, because of that spontaneous, magical thing that can sometimes happen, you know, that the, there's something almost like summoning a spirit from the beyond with every movie that's made, and I just felt like, yes, this, this uh, moving through the imagination, trying to tell unusual, interesting stories, trying to put, you know, stories on the screen that maybe haven't been seen or people haven't been seen on the screen before, like, yes, this weird alchemy is like what I'm going to do forever. Luckily, we put the fire out. <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't know that I've ever had that. I, I still haven't had that uh, aha moment uh, that I'm a director. Uh, I don't really, um, I'm still waiting to feel like that. Um, and I, don't, I guess I don't know that I ever will. Um, I get worried, I guess, uh, that the minute I say I am something, I, I, I won't want to do it anymore or that I won't be it. Um, you know, when when I'm trying to explain to somebody what filmmaking for me is like, it's like, uh, you know, because I write and direct and, and produce some too. Um, it's kind of like I'm either like being a stenographer, you know, when I'm writing, uh, or I'm I'm a, like a, an employee at a zoo. 
um, trying to keep all the animals in line. And it's, you know, like the other gentleman about wanting to get into the business, I would try and make something yourself to make sure you do, you know, because it's grueling. It's really hard. And, you know, uh, I was talking about my producer today. It was like, I learned the lesson that I can't wait around and, and uh, for somebody to tell me something that's going to make all of this worth it. Uh, it's got you got to want to do it and, and find joy in just like the little moments. So I don't know. I I, I haven't had that moment yet, and I, I guess uh, maybe I hope I never will. You know, mm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was curious to see what Joan would say. Um, yeah, I feel like uh, I went to film school before they had media studies. And um, I did experimental filmmaking, which is literally scratching on film and contact printing and, and talking about structuralism and semiology and all this stuff that was very not useful uh, in filmmaking, but interesting, I guess. Um, but I always thought of myself as a filmmaker, not as a director. Because, you know, as these guys are all showing you too, that. Uh, there are so many hats we wear, and it sounds like you're already a director. It sounds like you're a, a filmmaker for sure. And I would just um, start making your own stuff. And if that's really what the question is, you know, um, just trust your voice and, and do it. It's you know, it's it's at our fingertips these days. You know, you can really do it. And uh, yeah, don't don't worry. Don't wait for that moment. You know. I mean, that's only true if you actually want to be a director or a creator. Right. I mean, there there you know, we like to. <clears throat> We do a lot of, uh, we talk at a lot of libraries and I always like to bring a list. First of all, I like to tell people that if they're there to, because they want to be a director or an actor that they should leave. <laughs> uh, and then we talk about the 300 other types of jobs that exist in the film business. There's so many different jobs and so many different opportunities. So it's not all about being a director or being the star of the movie. Uh, there's a lot of different things uh, that are, really exciting, especially for kids. You know, we do the, the career day at the high school, and a lot of kids are inspired by the fact that they can potentially get into business as a live special effects person that makes bombs go off, and, uh, or squibs, or create blood, or, or, or you know, rain. So, uh, you know, you, if you like uh, doing spreadsheets the way I do, uh, there's a whole, bunch of people waiting f to hire you because uh, spreadsheets are very important in, in the filmmaking process. So th there's, like I said, there's like 300 different types of jobs from everything from driver to caterer to you name it. So there's a lot of opportunities out there. And every part is valuable and important. Mm. Yeah, it's a huge team effort. And that's what makes filmmaking so complicated. I mean, so amazing is that every element has to fit together and you have to, as a director or as a producer, you have to get all those people to work together uh, towards one goal. Yeah. And I will say one, uh, I totally agree with that, that community, that that family of artists making the movie together is what makes it great, you know. Um, I, I'll go, I remember when I was 19, I, I snuck into the after party for Pecker because I wanted to meet John Waters. And I had like <laughs> green hair and like a torn sweater and I went up to him. I'd read all his books and I loved his movies. I was like, John, you know, I kind of cornered him. I was like, you know, did you ever think when you were, you know, my age that you'd, you'd uh, you know, be here making movies? And he was like, I didn't think I'd be alive. <laughs> 20. And I said, John, do you have any advice for a young filmmaker? And he said, yes. And he thought for a second, he said, be a workaholic. Don't be new age. I don't know what he, exactly he meant by that, but I took the workaholic thing very, very seriously. And I think that's good advice for anybody working in any part of the film industry is like, it's something you got to balance it so you actually have a life, but like really just work all the time on your movies. Uh, I used to watch five films a day, but I cut it back so I could get a little sleep. But, you know, those were great days, you know. If you love this, just do it, and you are that thing once you do it. Yeah. Uh, and that's very line, since you're already doing that uh, exposure of all the other potential careers in filmmaking for kids. I've been asking Miera for a couple of years now to do that as a panel for us adults, because I kind of neurotically always watch the credits, 
and there's at least half of the jobs, and I'm not sure what the fuck they do. <laughs> <laughs> or what's a best boy or a key grip? I mean, right. there's a lot of things that, to me, need explaining. Yeah, that's something that, you know, keep your eye open for our library uh, talks. We do that. We, we tour three counties talking at libraries exactly about that, and we like to bring guests often with us, and they talk about what they do as well. Any other questions? Well then, thank you very much for coming out. Thank you. Thank you.